dude yo what's up what's going on not too much how's it going uh really well yeah how about you good uh just got off the trainer did a little stretching trying to get ready for this podcast let's go what was the trainer workout uh nothing (laughs) i'm just like riding uh just like 45 minutes zone one zone two just spinning the legs do you do recovery rides often? And we're just rolling. We'll do an intro in a second, but I think this is interesting. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not doing too much on the bike right now. Uh, I'm just kind of just riding for like general health and exercise. Um, so I've you know, been riding the trainer a lot lately, but not actually training per se. Just it's a bunch of 45 minute rides, honestly. What's the, how come? What's... Um, just, just kind of resetting, uh, after I got back from Belgium, uh, in sept in September, I kind of just wanted, like, there's all this kind of social pressure you put on your, or just pressure you put on yourself to train and live a certain way, like kind of hold yourself to such a high standard. Um, I wanted to reset and figure out if I was actually riding my bike for fun. Or to try to be, be somebody like, you know, you know what I'm saying? hundred percent, man. Yeah. So I'm just letting uh, natural, uh, you know, enjoyment fuel my activity for now. That's what I, I looked at last year. I didn't know the answer to, am I going to bike races because I want to go race? Or am I going to bike races? Cause I've always gone to bike races and that mm-hmm. all of a sudden really freaked me out. And I was looking around and, thinking i really like training i don't know if i want to leave right now and i had just recently moved to blowing rock so it's you know all new roads just new vibes and i didn't want to go and so i thought eh i don't think i'm gonna race and then i missed it and i'm glad i took that little bit of pause i really thought that riding a lot was what made me happy and long rides and then i just did that a ton and that got kind of boring. And then I was just really over and turned out and had no top end. I'm like, no, actually, okay. So that, that doesn't bring me joy. I do want to try and be fast still. It was an interesting process. So I, I know exactly a, a similar thread of what you're saying. And so, yeah, you strike me as a, well, who, yeah, man, this is like, we jumping in deep end. Um, <laughs> you strike me as a very more like well-rounded person slash athlete rather than hyper-focused cyclist. And maybe that's why you're so successful. I go through stages. Um, when I'm like focused on like a goal, I'm like definitely like too into my training, just like too, too focused. Um, you know, you could say I'm definitely out of balance in those, those periods, but you know, I come back around, kind of swing to the opposite end of the spectrum and just have fun and not worry about training, stressing too much. Do you think that out of balance is necessary or do you think said differently? Do you think that out of balance is what makes you so fast when you do go out of balance per se? Uh, Or, or let me ask you the third way. What if you didn't go out of balance? Do you think you'd be as fast <laughs> as you get each season? <laughs> uh, if I just stayed in a uh, robot form and trained, trained insane, I would definitely be on another level fitness wise, but I don't think I would like enjoy, like I would definitely get burnout. I wouldn't enjoy daily life. Probably wouldn't enjoy racing. It would seem like a burden. Um, so I think, uh, you know, once I relieved that pressure off of myself, I started racing a lot better. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't really, you know, start racing well until I just let myself enjoy it. Mm. It When was that? Um, 2018, I think. Uh, so I've been racing bikes since 2012 and I was, I was really good at training and I was really bad at racing for many years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, and then I, you could almost say I kind of like gave up on the sport, uh, I think around 2017 or so. Um, I just like quit my job to like ride and race full time and started finally able to like get some 20, 25 hour weeks. And like my power numbers were insane, but 
I just sucked at racing. <laughs> and so I just, I just kind of quit um, for that. I think it was the 2018 season. I think it was soon after Athens Twilight. I just kind of stopped racing and stopped riding. But uh, the next year, I came back, told myself I'm just doing it for fun, um, completely switched up my training. And, and I was fast, but I was like the weakest I'd ever been on a bike, like kind of the opposite style of rider everybody knows me as. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to race that way. I had to race like I was the weakest person in the group. And also, like, I didn't have any pressure on myself to win. And But uh, those two things combined, I started getting some results. And uh, so. so less, so, you, so it was less watts. So I'm hearing that correctly. It was less watts, but it was you racing differently. Instead of let me go just be the hammer and try and crush everybody, now you're, like, being strategy, and then you're seeing the results? Yeah, yeah. So um, for, like, the first six or seven years of me racing, you know, I, I didn't have any idea of what I was doing, <laughs> um, but I was very strong. So I would try to make the race, like I would try to make the race go how I wanted it to go, you know. So your get, threshold like, like 440, 450 in these days, are we talking? Um, the highest I've had it was a 20 minute at 465. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, just those... put, I just want to put this in context for people that don't know Brock. <laughs> like, yeah, dripping in watts. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, but that <laughs> obviously does not get you race results. Um, it's good to hear you say that as well because it's true. So, but... uh, yeah, I started racing as if I was the weakest person and didn't initiate anything, um, only responsive. And, you know, I didn't even, like, really bridge up to attacks. So I would just, you know – try to flow into moves and if i didn't flow into it you know pretty effortlessly i didn't go um mm. so it's completely different uh racing style mm -hmm. and i was trying to enjoy it so that was a big game changer <laughs> enjoy it gotta enjoy that that's yeah. i think that is easily missed and i think it's always an interesting journey because a lot of us in the states at least we find this sport in a point where, oh, I like riding. Oh, there's people racing. I'm going to go race. Oh, I'm hanging with my friends. I'm racing. This is cool. And then you start to improve and we start to get more laser focused and serious and the fun kind of, I don't want to have fun. I want to get my cat one. And I think mm -hmm. that's when people fall off. We were talking about this on a coach's call. Then when people get, you know, they go through cat three and then they get their cat two and then things get hard and the number of people that drop off. It's like, dude, you're you're like banging on the door of getting to your next level and you're starting to get beat up a little bit and that's part of the process. Like, this is hard. That's okay. We all go through it and just people give up and it's not fun. It's only results focused. Uh, it's all, And even more so now, it's numbers. The number of athletes that talk about other athletes, Strava, it's... <laughs> I'm so glad when we, when I started, there was no Strava. There was no, yeah. I had no idea what the other 60 guys did for the past three months in their base training. And you show up in the spring and you just figure people out from the next three months of racing. And it's like, Oh, that person's actually really slow. Oh, that person's actually really fast. Oh, it's just so different now. Um, yeah, I definitely, definitely operate better if I am not concerned with what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I was actually, I listened to your most recent podcast with the rider right before this call. And, um, I've already forgotten his name. I have a pretty poor memory, but he I'm trying was, to think who we just did. I, I think he was a first... sprinter dude, world tour. Oh, level, Riley, world tour. Yeah. 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 Um, and he was talking about some insane numbers. Like I've always felt pretty good, you know, about my power, especially being a bigger guy. It's, you know, half of it's there just because of my weight. Um, but like hearing him talk about numbers, I was like, man, like it was kind of like taking away some of my confidence. I'm like, maybe I'm not, you know, not quite as, uh, good as I thought. Um, which obviously like there's, there's levels to this and I'm definitely not at the top, but, uh, you know, what, what followed that was you can't really compare yourself. Like too many people compare themselves to like, other people's data and other people's results and stuff. But what I've realized is none of that really matters in a race. Um, you know, your, your fitness profile is like your toolbox and the race 
is the job and you show up to the race with your toolbox, but your tools don't matter if you don't use them correctly, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. It's like, especially this past season, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, but I, I stopped worrying so much about, you know, fitness and power numbers and comparing myself and just focused on the racing. Um, mm-hmm. cause all that, I mean, the ultimate goal is to do well in bike races. So when you get down to it, nothing else matters, you know, um, and the race, you know, determines the outcome. So just focus on the racing. Focus on the race. It's so what obsessed these days. And I think that having people hear you and so for people that don't know, whether it's been a time trial or road race, Brock has been on the Cat 1 Amateur Nats podium four times. Do I have that correct? Which um, 2019, 2021 twice, and 2023? Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that's anything? correct. Yeah. Which is, ironically, when you start talking about being more in the flow and not worrying about the results, and you're doing the biggest amateur race and getting on the podium, which is incredible. I think that I even laugh when amateurs hide power numbers. It's like, (laughs) okay, you either think you're that good or you have crazy weird self-confidence problems because like your 20 minute effort means nothing to how good of a bike racer you are. Like, what do you, what do you got to hide? And it's like, you're not Matthew Vanderpool. Just, just go be you, man. Just it's social media. Go do your thing. Um, so yeah, out of order. Let's do a little quick intro since I'm kind of throwing out some like who you are, but I'd love to hear who from you, who is Brock Mason? Uh, <laughs> I'm just a guy that rides bikes. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, like going to Athens to train a bunch. Um, and <laughs> trying to find, trying to keep everything in balance. I've been pretty obsessed with bike racing for uh, pretty much most of my the years since 2012 uh had a few uh a few brief breaks from racing over the over the past few years part of it uh with covid but um yeah i've spent most of my adult life racing bikes and i'm just trying to find a balance trying to build some general athleticism yeah you seem from the IGs, pretty good with the general athleticism. I mean, you're one of I. <laughs> one of the questions I usually ask: Are you in the gym? Yes or no. Brock's in the gym. It's more like: Are you on the hanging rings today, or are you <laughs> like flying across in a trapeze? Like, what are you up to, and how how is this bringing balance? But you did you, you used to lift a lot before cycling? Is that right? No. Um. So growing up, I pretty much just played video games. Like, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't do anything. Uh, there weren't like any athletes in my family. We, you know, weren't too educated on like general health and exercise. You kind of just did what you want, ate what you want. I, you know, in, high, in high, middle school, high school, played video games for like eight hours a day. I was pretty obsessed with that. What um, was the game? Call of Duty 4, Halo 2. Uh, so how old are you? 30, 32. Yeah, 32. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, I did, uh, race motocross a bit. I was extremely passionate about motocross, uh, lived, breathed, slept, dreamed everything about motocross. Unfortunately, I was not very good at it. Uh, so, um, and I was, I was in the gym a little bit for, for that, you know, injury prevention and stuff, but I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and then a friend, I was working on a friend's motorcycle one day and instead of him paying me cash, he gave me a single speed road bike. And I was like, Oh, this is cool. Like I've been trying to run, you know, like nine, 10 minute miles, but it's like blowing up my knees. So mm. I got the, uh, bicycle kind of felt a little bit cooler. Cause that's how all the motocross guys were training and, uh, showed up to some group rides. Um, long story I'm short, I was, speed. yeah, yeah. in Macon making Georgia. Um, long story short, I was pretty good at riding a bike. And after, you know, getting my hopes and dreams crushed at the motocross track, every time I went, um, <laughs> cycling was like the first physical thing I was good at. So kind of just switched over and, and here and we are. Was that like 2011? Uh, yeah, 2011, 2012. 
Okay. Right so around you're there. What, you're 21 ish is my, yeah. Memory. 21. Okay. Mm-hmm. What, what's the IG handle? Pedal Uh Pedally Boomaye. So I'm a, I'm a big uh, Muhammad Ali fan. And okay. his fight in Zaire, they were chanting Ali Boumaye. Uh, and so if you had P-E-D, uh, you know, to make pedal with the yeah. Ali Boumaye, it's pedally Boumaye. Got it. There's yeah. game, game has something with Ali Boumaye in one of his songs. I was like, either he's like a big game fan or there's something with pedaling. I didn't know the Ali. That's cool. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I know the song. That one's pretty dope. What's so Atlanta Rise next year, correct? Yeah, yeah. What's cracking with that? So new for those not familiar, new NCL squad, all Atlanta or is it all Georgia-based people or what's the vibe? It seems a little bit different than the couple other teams. Yeah, it's it's mostly Georgia-based. Uh, we do have a few guys outside of the state. I know Lucas Strain is is out is out of the state, but uh, he's he lived here last year. He's a really good friend. We were on ride bikes bros last year together. Um. But yeah, it's I'm I'm excited because most of the people are local and mm-hmm. um, pretty optimistic. You know, we'll have good turnouts at all the races, uh, so we'll see. What do you think of the format? So it, you know, the obviously crit stuff. Well, do you consider yourself like a crit guy, a time trialist? All around me, you smash road races. You're kind of one of those triple threat weapons. But is there something that you <laughs> lean into more? <laughs> what makes you laugh at that? I've I've put myself on all the extremes. Uh, I'm, I'm laughing because I can kind of. I feel like I'm pretty good at like transforming my body. Um, you know, there's like uh, 2000. I think 2021 or 2022. I was like really heavy in the gym, just focused on sprinting. You know, I could. You know, it was hitting like 17, 18, 1900 watts every sprint and like what, you know, like high 10, 15 second average, um, you know, like riding 185, 190 pounds. Then the next year or last last winter, um, you know, dropped weight. I was staying under 175, uh, like busting out these crazy like threshold numbers, just super aerobic and skinny. And then you know, I've raced in between like race 180, kind of an all arounder. So I could, I feel like I could do a lot with my body. <laughs> That's uh, but wild. what I prefer, I do kind of, well, my favorite racing is the Kermesses in Belgium. But uh, I feel like what suits my natural, like what my body tends to want to do naturally is like the short burst um, anaerobic efforts. Mm. Uh, so my favorite workout are 3030s. Mm. and and i'll be rocking those in season and i love it how many do you do when you do them are you doing like so uh, sets? you doing 10 minutes of it what's the like nitty-gritty i i i work up to it um uh so kind of like early season training i'll i really focus on being able to produce a high anaerobic power so i might start with like one one minute a uh, minute and a half, work up to two minutes, just really high um, peak power for that duration. Oh, complete recovery in between. And then I'll kind of transition into the repeatability and like kind of lactate clearance. And then I'll, you know, go to like something like the 3030s. I usually keep most of my training pretty simple. Um, but for the fr- 3030s, I might do the first couple workouts, do like sets of 12 or 13. Um, okay. just like do two sets. Mm. So that would be 12 repetition of 30, 30. So you get six minutes of, uh, like working time, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But then your heart rate is elevated for the 12 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. so it's a good balance there with some cardiovascular adaptations, mm-hmm. but ideally when I'm like really rolling good, I'll do two sets of 16, 30, 30s. So, so that's, eight minutes, eight minutes. Mm-hmm. And that, so you do that four times or so eight and eight. So 16 minutes total or 32 minutes total. Uh, it's two sets of 16. So kind of the total workout time is 32 minutes, but Got the it. total time producing power is 16. Cool. Yeah. 
do you go full gas and let the watts degrade over time or do you try and pace it at a particular percentage or number or any target or how do you execute those? So for the 3030s, I would try to um, pace it kind of, kind of just pick a number and hold it. Um, okay. So let's say if like a person was wanting to average like 500 for the 3030s, mm-hmm. I mean, pretty much just try to hold 500 or you might, um, I tend to like, I think negative pace everything. It's like, I might start at like 480, ramp it up to like 510, 515. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, I always tend to really push myself uh, with the averages. So I might, you know, kind of overreach, you know, within the interval, start at like 520 and then fade back down to 500. But when I'm kind of fresh, more fresh and in control, I try to negative pace everything. Okay. Yeah, I'm always curious about those because some people, it's like full gas, you know, like we'll stay with the 500 number. Full gas, they're doing 550. By the end of the set, they're doing 450. But they're like, well, my heart rate's up more initially. Da, da, da. They're looking maybe from more from the cardiovascular side. Other people talk about how you're saying, like, let me negative split and increase the watts as I go across. Other people kind of change if they're doing it like you brought up being fresh or if they're doing it at the end of a ride. And so some have even said, I'm just doing it by RPE, like 9 out of 10. Like, it, this really is not pleasant, but I'm not, like, fully killing myself. So what's uh, when you brought up Belgium, what did what's like a good lesson that you brought from racing back there? What was that whole experience like? Because from we quickly chatted when I was asking you what you were heading over there for. And I was like, you going for vacation? You're like, dude, the racing. I was like, oh, dude, <laughs> all right, let's go. Yeah. And were you did you just spur were you like, hey, I'm just gonna go to Belgium and race? Or was there a what was the um, motivation? So, stuff? so I've kind of wanted to go to Belgium. Uh, like race in Belgium the whole time I've been riding bikes. Uh, everybody's okay. always, everybody's always told me I would do good there. And like that style of racing um, suits me. And it just, you know, not really knowing anything about it and coming up to the ranks, it just had this like prestigious aura to it. <laughs> the kind of magical, like, Oh, that, that's where you go to, you know, see what you could do on a bike. Um, and, you know, the past few seasons, um, I've, I've kind of been more focused on nationals and time trialing. I really wanted to win a amateur national time trial jersey, which has always seemed to slip away from my fingers every year. But Close. Uh, I think, you know, I've been racing bikes for a while and, you know, always like going through different mental stages and everything. But this past year I was – you know, did, I, don't, I don't know how long I'm going to keep racing. In this past year, I was in, like, better physical shape, better race shape, like, better mentally than I ever have been. Um, and I wasn't sure, like, if, you know, be the same next season. So I wanted to do it while I still had it. And, uh, yeah, so I just hopped over to Belgium and uh, did my best. And won twice, was it? Yeah, I won I won two races. Uh, I got second in another race. Yeah. The, yeah. the style of racing really suits me over there. So what was that like? Explain that for people that have only heard of, like, like you said, people talk about Belgium and the racing, but what was it actually like being there? Yeah. So I, as, as far as the racing, I think I only did, uh, uh, just a handful of races, maybe like 10. And I was racing mainly on the, um, the East side of, of Belgium. Uh, doing like 1.12 Bs. I did one, 1.1 A, but, um, how would you carry Was that like a P one, two race here? Is that like, a man, I don't, I don't know. Cause it's just so different. So all the races yeah. I did, they're pretty much dead flat. Might have like a little rise or kicker, but I mean, no real Hills. Um, they're all around like a five or six kilometer loop, uh, through towns and the country roads. So they're all like, 13, 15 laps. Every race was like two and a half hours. Every race average, you know, between 27, 30 miles an hour. And they're like full gas. Um, It, I, it seemed like everybody was just like riding as hard as they could. Like you couldn't really (laughs) like ride a bike any faster. Um, People were constantly attacking, constantly following, you know, 
bridging up. It was just just literally full of gas the whole time. And it seemed like the only time um, a break would get away was if like the Peloton sat up for like just a split second or just like nobody happened to like, like if there was just like a little separation, a little hesitancy between the group and the Peloton, you'd get a gap. But like I, like I would be in the break, we'd be doing 30 miles an hour. I'd be in the Peloton, we'd be doing 30 miles an hour. Like it was just insane. Everybody was always going like the same speed. Um, but with that said, races in the U S I don't know why those don't exist anymore. There are a few, um, shoot. The big one up in mass was, uh, God used to be part of a stage race. It was like one of the bat most badass stages. And anytime, I think the last time I did a circuit race was like 10 years ago that like 15 laps, two and a half hours. It's like long enough that you need some endurance. Like it's, you can't really get by on these hour training rides, but like, damn, two and a half hours yeah. full gas is killer. Yeah. I, I love that. It, it is the perfect duration. Cause you have to, I mean, I was having to ride as smart as possible and like conserve as much energy as possible. Um, that was a big focus of mine was just being smart and conservative. Um, but you know, the races are so hard, like people just get shattered. Like they're, they're literally like at the bottom of their gas tank, you know, the last Mm -hmm. lap, everybody is, um, everybody's just shattered. And so what I was doing over there was, you know, being conservative, trying to get in the lead break. And then, um, usually like between two and four K out from the finish, I just attack and right away because everybody's so blown, you know, like there's, not really much teamwork in the races I was in. And then unless somebody, unless somebody follows you, like nobody is really going to chase you. So if you got the legs to, to keep your speed up to the finish line, you can stay away. Hmm. What's since the racing is different. Is there anything that you learned over there that, that you felt like you could come back and apply to the big U S races, whether it be something where you're, punching at or above your weight, maybe at Pronats or something, or even just at like, you know, a hard P one, two regional race. Uh, just the focus on being, you know, conservative and racing smart, which like everybody always says that, like, it's kind of, you know, basic bike racing one Oh one. And I, I mean, I was focused on it before I went over there, but being in the races over there and, you know, knowing, just being in that intensity for two and a half hours kind of really made me dial that into the next level. Mm. What's so you kind of brought up just missing the top step at nationals. Is that a big focus for 2024 or when you're going through this period of your easy zone one rides, what are you thinking about in 2024? What's the big goal? Uh, Probably the first year. I don't really have any goals. Um, mm. just, just trying to ha- have fun and just be like generally fit and athletic. Like I'm trying, I'm starting to run a little bit, extremely casually. I am, you would not define me as a runner at all, but, uh, just trying to like enjoy kind of the athleticism I've been building for the past 10 years, you know, off the bike. Mm. Uh, but just, yeah, just looking to enjoy racing. So did this have some play in your sporadic trip to Japan? No, completely unrelated. Um, What (laughs) you going on that? And people have to go back and look at his Instagram post where it was like, Hey, I didn't tell anybody about this, but I booked this ticket three days ago. Here I am. And you went on this backpacking just adventure. What was the inspiration for this then? (laughs) Uh, Hopefully I, I won't make this too long winded, but oh, we're good. I've always wanted to go to Japan. Uh, always been fascinated with it. Uh, what fascinates you about it? I don't know. Just their whole culture. It's, I mean, they're completely different over there. Um, mm-hmm. Society, like the language, the food, everybody's just so respectful and polite and, and everything is like just so orderly. It's, it's another world. Cause I've been to like different countries uh, and like the people, like the people themselves all have a similar vibe, just like kind of with different aesthetics or, you know, language, 
but over there it was completely different and um it's kind of the whole history and everything just seems so like mystical or what or unknown to like a westerner you know mm-hmm. um just culture just seems like really peaceful and very mindful uh so anyway um this past thanksgiving i haven't really been riding uh, you know his historically like my life has been centered around cycling like trying to ride as much as i can all that but i wasn't i haven't really been riding much this fall um just saw family didn't really want to go travel to see them again on thanksgiving and i just kind of want to like have a low key time to myself and a friend at work was like asking me what my thanksgiving plans were because you know everybody has thanksgiving plans and this was like the thursday before thanksgiving like a week before and you know i told him like oh, i don't i don't have anything like I'm not doing anything and then it kind of dawned on me like i'm not riding I'm going to have all this time off of work. I could like literally do whatever I wanted. So I checked flights and flights to Japan were super cheap. It was like $1,100 round trip. Damn. And so Friday night, I booked a ticket to Japan, didn't have housing, didn't have transportation, like didn't know anything. Um, so booked a, fr- a ticket Friday night. Departure was Tuesday morning. Uh, so yeah, I just <laughs> spent the next like every single waking hour trying to plan that trip out and uh yeah so got over and you there. were like i'm gonna go amazing. bike so what, you're you're thinking i'm gonna go backpack through because i read the caption so i know what happens mm-hmm. yeah. i mean i have a bunch of questions so you what's the pl- what were you planning to do you're gonna go on this um, hike so i wanted to see I love the long pause there. Like, where do I begin? <laughs> um, yeah. I've, so I've always been drawn to like kind of a spiritual experience in Japan. Um, okay. I've kind of always told myself if, if my life like gets really, really bad, if I'm like mentally at the worst, uh, I wanted to go live in a monastery and become a monk just to try it. <laughs> what, uh, what, what would be the bad? I'm just curious when you sit, what would be bad in your life or what would be the worst or what would make things fall off? Like what, what is that? Um, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Really you can know. pass. You can pass. Yeah. Okay. Um, just, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, um, let's see. So yeah, I've, I've always kind of been drawn to their uh, religious culture and their spirituality. And within the past couple of years, I, I came, just randomly came across like this, I think it was called Segundo or something. I'm probably getting that pr- pronunciation wrong, but they were doing these like spiritual pilgrimages through the mountains in Japan, like not talking, you know, dressed in um, traditional attire, uh, you know, meditating, like little food or minimal food, doing these rituals at the shrines and stuff. And, you know, just being present in the mountains and, and like, I guess kind of re rediscovering yourself. Um, so that, that was kind of in the back of my mind. So I wanted to see, uh, you know, some like real authentic historical, you know, uh, less traveled path type stuff in Japan. And I came across this hike, I thought it'd be really cool to do. Um, but then I got to researching it and keep in mind, like I'm flying out in like a day or two. <laughs> uh, so I don't really have time to, to really plan this, uh, but I'm researching it and people are saying you have to like book accommodation, like six months in advance at the guest houses. Um, my impression was that you wouldn't be able to get food along the, the trail unless you were at the guest houses. So I was like, man, like, I'm not going to be able to book accommodation. I'm not going to be able to find food. And then by that point, my mind was pretty set on doing this hike if I went to Japan. And like, I couldn't like reopen my mind to other possibilities. So I was like getting kind of bummed out, overwhelmed. And I took a break from planning and was like just playing on Instagram. And I came across this video of Dana White, who had just was talking about an 84 hour fast he did 
Oh my God. And I was like, man, like that's pretty crazy. And then I got to thinking I could just fast and camp and that solves both of my issues. So I, uh, went to REI the next day, bought a bunch of camping gear. Cause I'd never been camping before. Uh, never been like backpacking or anything. <laughs> um, so got all my stuff, flew over to Japan with, with my hiking bag and one pair of clo- one change of clothes and then had my last meal at midnight uh, when I got over there and just woke up the next morning at 6 a.m., took the trains out to the trail and went on my little spiritual journey. And how long was this supposed to be? Well, how long were you planning it to be? So uh, the total route I was planning on doing, I think, was was right around 68 kilometers. And they say online it takes between four and five days. Oh and, you know, kind of being an elite endurance athlete, I had a very extreme false sense of confidence of my hiking ability, which would later be a comically false sense of confidence. Um, oh my God. So I went over there anticipating to do, you know, like 12 hour days on the trail, hiking fast and doing it in three days. So three days of hiking, three days of camping, then I'd bust back to town. Um, come to find out, hiking is extremely difficult, and I'm very bad at it. And I was hiking at a comically slow pace. Mm. And um, long story short, I did half of the anticipated journey, uh, but still did two full days of hiking, two nights of camping. And definitely, I got, I got, definitely got more out of it than I could have hoped for, even though I did half the trail. Can you share what you got out of that? The deepest, <laughs> the deepest thing that you took from that? Man, I, I don't know how to put it in words. Like, I don't know how to put the takeaway in words, but what I'll tell you is like my experience. Um, so like I said, I didn't, I didn't tell anybody I was going except for a couple of friends I invited who I thought would, you know, who would be down to go with me on some crazy spontaneous adventure. Um, unfortunately they couldn't make it, but didn't tell anybody I was going. So I was kind of had that like isolation, uh, from the start, um, while I was on the trail, you know, I didn't, wasn't playing on my phone, like wasn't, um, listening to music, wasn't on social media or anything. And so I really kind of isolated myself while I was on the trail and you don't really see any other, any other people out there. Like Mm -hmm. I probably passed like maybe five people total in the two days. Um, and, uh, you know, being in the fasted state was, was a cool experience. Like just a different level of calmness and clarity that fasting brings to everything. Um, and so, yeah, you know, just being out on in the Japanese wilderness on is literally like a sacred like pilgrimage route that's been there for over a thousand years. So you're just kind of um, immersed in this like spiritual energy um, out in nature, disconnected from everybody. And, you know, just just with your thoughts and nothing else. So it's trying to meditate, just thinking about life, thinking about how my mind works while I was out there. And, um, you know, I, I was underprepared, wore the, probably the worst possible footwear choice. You I was going to ask you if you had hiking boots, which I'm guessing is a no. Oh my God. I can't even imagine that. I wore these like minimalist shoes cause they looked cool. Oh, <laughs> I, was, I was kind of like, kind of into like, strengthening my feet, building up my feet before the trip. Uh, kind of jump into extremes whenever I do something. And I was like, it's definitely... not a good two days. I don't know how much training <laughs> yeah. you got done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very stupid decision. Oh. A little too optimistic, but... Uh, what was the temperature yeah, so, and altitude? Were you at altitude? Not at altitude. Um, okay. During the day, the temperature was probably like 60 or 70. It was pretty nice in the sun. And then at night, it would dip down, you know, in the 40s. Um, But yeah, the footwork, going back to the feet, my feet were completely like smashed. Um, The end, like the last two hours of the first 
day of hiking was the worst pain I'd ever been in, second to my Tulsa crash. Um, and I mean, like with every step, like it was it was pretty bad. That first night, making my making my way to the campsite on that first night in the dark, hardly able to walk. Like I was, I was like taking half steps. If I stepped on like a a rock or a pedal pebble, oh, I would like dude. collapse out of like the pain. Just I was I was really messed up and very emotional. Like it it pretty much like mentally broke me that first night and I, I couldn't believe it, you know? Um, and, but I was able to recover a good bit that first night. I woke up the next morning, went to like their hot baths they have massaged out my muscles, tore all of the pages out of my notebook, folded them up, put them in my shoes to like reinforce the insoles. And then I was like, you know, able to limp along a bit. And, uh, yeah, set out again that next day, having to cover, like, um, almost twice the distance I did in the first day. So that was a pretty, pretty big commitment I jumped in on. Um, the paper help in the shoes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it helped tremendously. Uh, <laughs> the notebook paper. Uh, but, um For people that yeah, haven't I hiked, mean, I mean, I've hiked in North Carolina and from... I have hiking boots that people are like, you need the stiff sole. And then a day I just had my sneakers. I did the same exact route. I, it was brutal on my feet. So I cannot even imagine minimalist shoes hiking for that. Well, I mean, yeah, the shoes I had, you could literally roll them up and put them in your pants pocket. I know. Are they, um, Vivo? Uh, very similar. They're a German brand. I think they're called wildlings. Okay. Uh, very cool shoes, but just not for hiking. Yeah, but going back to the experience thing, um, that second day, just being out in the mountain range by yourself in nature, ev- like just alone with your thoughts, every single step is like a meditation on pain and suffering and acceptance. <laughs> it wow. sounds dramatic, but it, it was pretty intense. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I mean, fasting and in that environment, it's even... I'll go on a three mile hike and there's a lot of places where I live that don't have cell service. So even as I drive to the trailhead, it's like the phone goes out and I'll still bring my phone with me. I sometimes don't know why, but just not being able to communicate, not being able to send a text to somebody if I want to is a different feeling than having the capability in your pocket and not doing it. I don't know mm-hmm. what that is or what the brain, how my brain processes that, but I can only imagine being in Japan and doing that. And where do you think the next, would you go on another random adventure like this in the future? Like, has it fueled you to want to do this again? Just spin the globe and pick a cool place or where does this take you? Yeah. I've always wanted to do adventures like this. Um, you know, I've always had like a full time, a job with a limited vacation. So like I've, I've always had to like, I mean, all my vacation time has gone to bike racing, mm. which is the, you know, severely limited these other adventures, but it's something I've always been wanting to do. Uh, the Japan trip has definitely helped me overcome kind of the, uh, the fear aspect of jumping into the unknown. Um, I don't, I don't think it could get much gnarlier than just hopping over to Japan on four days notice <laughs> uh, by myself. But um, one experience I've always thought would be cool, and this is like a very, very specific imagery, but I've always wanted to go to the Middle East and just like be dressed in, you know, the traditional attire, riding like camels or horses or something through the desert, like under the moonlight, mm. like very specific imagery and scenario, but you know, something like that would be an an amazing adventure. That sounds dope. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's funny that you bring up the, so what do you do? What's your day job? I work with a construction company and we build new apartment complexes and I just, uh, work on the computer all day, kind of doing price estimation, uh, Mm -hmm. CAD drawings, uh, um, stuff like that. When you talk about like, you know, the vacation time going to bike racing, I've thought about that a lot. And I was, 
you know, I, I think of how I thought last season and kind of the, like, what was my why for bike racing and it, going through that was not only a good thing that it made me realize how much I do love training and I do love racing, but it's also made me reflect a little bit more on the non bike time that I choose to spend. And I guess I say that in like, I was talking to my husband, Chris, about what we wanted to do. I'm kind of like already planning 2025. I'm like, all right, we're not going to do a big trip this year. Like we should do something like mega next year. Where haven't you been? And we were talking about Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, and possibly Thailand. And Mm -hmm. immediately my brain is like, Ooh, that's going to be hard to bring a bike there. And then the thing I've just went through was like, yo, dude, are you seriously worried about the bike when you're like, I love to travel. Like I should not have any ooh feeling towards that. And so you brought up running and it's something that I've slowly kind of been dabbling in my feet. Well, I shouldn't say slowly the third run. I don't know if I like pulled my, i the internet tells me it's the soleus. Like my leg kind of like blew up. Something was angry at me, but I'm like, Hey, I should at least be able to jog. And then I thought, dude, I haven't ran in seven years. Like if you told me to go run five miles, I couldn't. And that made me yeah. sort of disappointed in myself as what I would, I would consider myself an athlete, but I can't beat some people in a five mile race. Like that's kind of pathetic. So I'm kind of like building up to that. I love strength training in the gym. And it's just interesting to hear you say something similar of, you know, looking at a full athlete profile, not maybe spending all of my time to only bike racing. And I think in pulling back a little bit, it will help amplify the bike racing that I do do. And that some other activities in the mix and adventures will probably only help my longevity as being an athlete. So I, you know, that's, I'll I'll definitely be thinking of your comment um, as I go through like I don't want to say like mental processes, but like whenever I think about that, I think it's natural. And I, and I think a lot of newer athletes freak out when they start to have those thoughts. And that's one thing I try to always tell people is like, it's okay to not be hyped on going to this race. And maybe you shouldn't go. Maybe mm-hmm. you need to tell your team, Hey, the, you know, for X, Y, and I'm just not in this, this is not working out right now. Cause we all put so much pressure on ourselves once we commit and get into it. And, um, you had brought up like this kind of the spiritual side of the trip. Do, are you in there? Jap, Japan is mostly Buddhist. Is that right? And you meditate. Are you into like religious vibes or meditation um, on a daily or is this more just like a trip spiritual thing? Uh, I've always been into it kind of like since high school, I've uh, you know started learning about Buddhism and stuff. And it's, it's been a while since like you could say I've like actually like studied, um, the, the religion or, and their practices, but I, I've always been into the kind of the spiritual and psychology and perspective side of things. And, um, uh, this past year I've been like reading a lot of, you know, you kind of call them self-improvement books or whatever, but Mm -hmm. just, just trying to learn more about how my brain works and how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive time and, um, it's kind of how we label every interaction and, and every event. Like we, uh, yeah, just, just going into how the mind works. Any books that as you're talking about this to come to mind that you're like specifically thinking about? Cause it sounds super interesting. Yeah. So one of the books I recently read was, uh, wherever you go, there you are. Mm, I, yeah. I, th- I think that's the name the title of the book. Yeah. And then one, I, just finished um reading a couple of days ago was called already free by bruce tift discovered that through a tim ferris uh, recommendation um, okay. but already free by bruce tift that was a very dense read it tift I, t-i-f-f t-i-f-t tift got it yeah and he's actually a psychologist he's been practicing for 40 or 45 years and he blends western practices with buddhism because he studied both Mm. and that was a really dense book that was really good information in that but um yeah i'm just trying to always be mindful and conscious of you know what we're thinking and why we think it Mm -hmm. rick rubin just came out with his book uh creative act i want to say it's on it's he you know rick rubin i'm do you know him he's like i've I've heard the name yeah, so he's a producer, worked with like Beastie Boys, every big name from 
I think Run DMC to pop people now. Uh, he, it's funny when he talks about what he provides. Like he's not a technical producer, but he's there for like flow and just has, he says, strong opinions on what sounds good and what doesn't. And he's very kind of like Zen Buddhist monk ish. And his book is interesting. I'm only about halfway through, but it's very small chapters, a lot of little things that some are super, like a couple of paragraphs that like hit really hard. And it's like, ooh, I like, I need to remember this and just how creativity unfolds and how to work through like block blocks that we hit and when to keep going and when to cut something and that you're really we're all creating our own art or we should be for ourselves not for the other people around us and that when one thing that I just read that really kind of resonated you know if you're making something that really matters half the people are going to hate it right away and I think mm-hmm. like a classic example is Hey Ya by Outkast people were telling them people were telling Andre if you put this song out your career is over and it's probably one of the biggest songs of our generation so yeah it's interesting buddhism i was taking a world religions class uh so at the age of 20 or 19 i just remember i can't even remember what the reading sparked but the professor being like the whole point is that there's not a finite amount of goodness like your friend getting theirs doesn't mean you're not going to get yours and as an immature and you know, me focused, hungry for my own success. It was like, oh yeah, okay. Maybe I do need to root for the other guy just as much as I'm rooting for myself because them winning doesn't mean I'm losing. And it's just such a simple thought. But Mm -hmm. I think for me at that age, it was like, ooh, yeah, I need to look around at what other religions are. I wish I had this other book. There's one that's like, I can't remember the title. It's a... It basically looks at all these different religions and does like five page synopses and just like high points to like taste it. And it was just really cool. I found it randomly in this bookstore. Um, that, anyway, sounds, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. It had like a religion section. It had like a science section. It had um, like famous political viewpoints or something. It was just, it was a weird like conglomeration of thought. Hmm. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look it up. Um, what's okay? What do you think has usually? I ask this cycling specific, but for you, I think it's more like maybe training or even life adventuring. What do you think that you've learned? Let's go with life about life that's made you better at living life. About better at living, I kind of hate the term, but your best life, like you continue to grow and improve. Mm. Um, Uh, I'm just trying to think of how to like phrase it. Uh, the book I just finished reading kind of covers it very well. The already free book. Um, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people kind of, uh, grow up with these defense mechanisms around certain emotions or feelings or like insecurities. And, uh, they kind of, carry that with them in their adult life. And they, uh, they just like need to allow themselves to be more vulnerable and open to different experiences and open to different, you know, ways of living, different people. And, uh, just realize that like their way isn't the right way. Like nobody's, nobody's way of doing anything is the right way. They're just different. Um, and so just to be in, like more open to new ideas and such and, and kind of become aware of uh, your insecurities. And there's another word I'm trying to think of. I'm blanking right now, but just don't be so defensive about, about stuff <laughs> mm-hmm. and be open and, and, and enjoy and love life. Yeah, I think it's easy for me to project my insecurity to other people. If I'm, mm-hmm. this is, ah, oh, I don't feel strong about this. Well, let me put this person down in my head and that'll make me feel better. It's like, oof, dude, what are you doing? Like, yeah, that, that's not the way. Oh man, what's, we were kind of chatting about nutrition off the bike and on the bike, but what's your, what's, when I just bring up nutrition, how, what's your like style of eating? 
Uh, it varies a lot. Uh, I'm always, I mean, even with training, like I'm always experimenting and trying new stuff. Currently, uh, so let me back up a bit. Uh, pretty much like most of my life, I've eaten a ton of food. Um, like I just, I just like, I'll get to eating and I can't stop until I'm like mm. physically like at my max capacity. <laughs> like, well, like even cool. when I'm, even when I'm full, I like want to eat more. And part of that initially was like how I was raised, like small Southern town, like everybody, like you're supposed to be like big and eat a lot and all this crap. Um, so I was kind of raised like that, but, but I realized, I mean, despite my conscious efforts of trying to eat less, it was like extremely hard to control uh, mm -hmm. or like limit how much I was eating, even though my stomach was full, um, like no hunger pains or whatever. I just like wanted to keep snacking. And so I was did some research recently on like uh, like your insulin response and blood sugar levels and like how that's influencing your perception of hunger. Mm. Uh, and so, which is shaped how I'm currently eating, which is like low carb. I'm basically trying to like minimize insulin response with with my current diet and trying to eat less, eat like a normal person. <laughs> um, trying to slim up a bit, burn some fat because, you know, snacking all the time, eating high carb for my body. I think I just like either had constantly elevate, elevated blood sugar, elevated insulin, like something was, was out of whack and was making me feel hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. And so the way, the way, the reason I eat the way I do right now <clears throat> is just simply to try to get a control over my appetite. Mm hmm and That's stabilize the blood, like the hormones and stuff. Yeah, I think there's going to be, God, I have so many things. There, Tim Podlegar is a up and coming nutritionist. Guys like Asker, Juke and Drew point to him as like the future of sports science. And we were chatting about carbs because he made a comment about maybe 120 grams isn't the best way to go. And maybe we need to be going in at like 60 to 90 grams and then only ramping the carbs up at our like two and a half till the end of the rider race up to five hours. And I'm going to get him on, but we were kind of chatting about a couple things. And in this past year, you know, I've just had some issues with it's, I really believe it's been way too many carbs or just, it might just have been also a decade of carb loading <laughs> and what I thought I could just, you know, I was riding so much and everything's like more carbs, train your gut to eat more carbs. Like the more carbs you process, the faster you are. And I don't think I would have noticed this. I think my body is slowing down a little bit, almost 42, or maybe it is just the, the duration of doing this, but I'm kind of with you on the off the bike. I'm very new to this in the past three weeks. I've made massive changes that have made drastic changes to how I feel. Um, I always wondered what was inflammation. I didn't know what that was until I'm realizing how much looser I feel and how much mm -hmm. more fluid I feel on the bike. And it really, I wouldn't have gone down this road if I didn't have this back pain that came up and, um, it's just been an interesting adventure. I, you know, there's going to be, I'm going to have a lot to talk about because I've been so pro carb for so long. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious how I'm not going no carb. And right now I would say I'm in like in between carnivore and keto. Um, and I do think carb is still important for hard efforts, maybe. But then there's guys like Tim Noakes. I don't know if you know the name. I was talking to him on Twitter, and he's like, just go fat. That is the that is the rocket fuel. And I'm like, this is crazy. But I don't know. I did a really solid five-hour endurance ride um, on 60 grams of carbs total, which normally, yeah, yeah normally. It's not much. <laughs> it's not much. It was a 1,000 grams of walnuts. And then I had a chocolate bar and I brought candy with me as like nine one one and just put it in mm -hmm. my, my uh, frame bag. And so I'm like, man, maybe I could, I could, I think I could do it on no carbs. Like I'm going to, I don't know what I would put in a flask, like MCT oil or something. And some people I know, there's a guy who's reached out to me back from pro carb stuff. He is carnivore and he's like, dude, I don't eat on these four hour rides. He, 
the thing we have gone back, he's a cat four. He's like, listen, you're burning way more. Maybe that's a thing to think about. But I'm like, dude, I just did this on 60 grams of carbs. Like that, I would normally bring 600 grams of carbs. That, mm -hmm. Let's talk about inflammatory response. Like it's gonna be crazy, crazy yeah. different. So we'll see where it goes. But yeah, that's interesting. I think balance is key. And um, I never thought about the inflammation in the context of like, while you're consuming carbs while you're racing or, so or, or the, riding. This is uh, depending on who you talk to so far from what I've gathered and trying to talk to people smarter than me about this. Some are like, well, you're you you're utilizing that fuel. It's no big deal. Whatever type of carb you eat. Mm -hmm. Other people are saying, well, there's still going to be byproducts. So you're, you're, you know, you burn a piece of paper, like smoke comes up, like there's things you're burning something in your body. Um, this guy that I'm seeing, and I don't want to overtake this podcast about my story, but I'll just quickly share. It's like the, I did different PTs. I did dry needling. I did, I was doing 30 minute stretching routines. I was doing this type of exercise. I was strengthening this. I was removing this. So over two years, tried all these different modalities where like it would work. I'm like, oh, I got it. And then it would come back. And then, oh, wait, no, no. Now you go see this person. Da, da, da. Finally ended up on this uh, Chinese medicine guy who's from Spain, has trained in uh, Thailand and China for over 20 years, I want to say at this point. And Eduardo. And he was like, dude, you need herbs. He's like, you're super tense. You're super tight. And when I told him what I was eating, he's like, wait, you're actually eating that many carbs. And I'm like, well, and a lot of it's sugar and like maple syrup. And he's like, dude, that that's your problem. And I'm like, no, probably not. And he's like, probably. <laughs> so I'm like, I've just like, whatever. Okay. I'm going to see what you do, what you have to say. And in a week and a half, it like started to my, I was like turning. I'm like, oh my God, dude, I'm so loose and like mobile. What is mm -hmm. going on? And, uh, and he was saying it's because of the inflammation reduction. I think so. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Huh. Um, I have two more questions for you. If you got it. Oh yeah. Got time. Oh, plenty of time. You had a post on Instagram and the caption was just make every second feel like two. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that was a quote that a mutual friend of my best friend who passed away said. So uh, my best friend or, you know, one of my best friends, Travis Rust, uh, he was, he was not a cyclist, but he was, uh, you know, taught me a lot about health and athletics and everything. He's big into the ninja, um, American Ninja Warrior. He was really good on that. Mm. Um, but he was, dude, he was, like, physically, like, capability, he, he was incredible. Um, and, man, <laughs> there's so much to say about him. Like, that's, like, the way he thought and his advice and everything and he was just so influ influential and inspirational like i mean he inspired pretty much everybody he came in contact with it was it was crazy um uh so where was it going oh the quote um so yeah he passed away on uh in a motorcycle accident completely unexpected of course just crazy and one of his roommates, a really good friend of his, now a friend of mine, uh, you know, in his little write up about Travis passing away, he said one of his favorite quotes that Travis used to say was make every second uh, count or make every second feel like two or yeah. whatever it was. And I'm a bit embarrassed to say I'm kind of blanking on the exact meaning of that. I'm going to have to reach out to our friend to kind of get some clarification. But, you know, if I would just sit here and interpret it right now, I would think, you know, just slow down and live in the present moment yeah. and um, stop, uh, stop worrying about, try, stop trying to live in the future, stop fearing the future. You know, don't, don't be letting the past drag you behind. Just, just be mm -hmm. present, slow time down and, Mm -hmm. live now. Yeah, I think that's 
that's sort of how I was interpreting it just from reading it. And I think the picture was great. Someone was like, what do you guys, what seance are you guys at? And I was like, this is, I love this. And I think, Oh, we were on the dock. Yeah. 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 And it's just one, one of my hangups is that I project like insecurities into the future. And somebody um, in this group I'm in is like, it's funny. We worry about all these things in the future that never actually happen. Like mm-hmm. half the stuff plus is just why are you worrying about that? And um, yeah, it's just so when you say not looking back, but looking forward and being present, it's just interesting how time all relates. And you brought up time before, and I heard this really interesting podcast about how as humans, why are we so bad at understanding our future self? And they had these neuroscientists that were looking at our the way our brain reacts when we think of ourselves, when we think of other people. And when we think of someone say, hey, however they trigger you to think of yourself in the future, the brain maps it more as if we're thinking of someone else. So we're not hmm. even thinking of it as ourselves. We don't even see our future self as us. It's someone totally different than us. So yeah, being present has been something I've been really trying to... Folk, God, we could go on a wormhole on this. Oh, yeah. I mean, getting married has changed how I think about some of that stuff and like my day to day actions. But, huh. um, my last question for you what, what are you trying to improve on going in? We're on, so we're recording this a couple days before the new year. This, we won't post this until probably like late February, March. As we go into 2024, what are you trying to improve on this year? Uh, so not, not with uh, cycling, but pretty conscious goals that I've, you know, been slowly working towards. Uh, it's like flexibility, uh, like mobility. Uh, I would like to get comfortable running. Uh, and these are pretty like surface level things. Uh, but like deeper is just uh, being more mindful, more present, more aware. Uh, kind of want to learn more about like uh somatic practices and stuff and bring awareness back to my body so it is more like mental spiritual type of work i'm i'm uh, what does that mean? What's somatic towards. Practice mean what does that mean so my understanding is bringing your awareness back to your body okay. uh so and i had a friend who was studying this uh or practicing it learning about it he walked us through like this 20 minute meditation uh you know somatic focus and it was pretty crazy, like how your perception of your body and awareness just was able to change that quickly. Um, so I, I was kind of explaining this to Forrest a couple of days ago, a uh, surprise visit by him. We had an excellent session at the gym together, but uh, my, my knowledge of somatic practice is extremely elementary right now, but the way I described it to him was Typically, I feel like most of us, um, our reality is kind of stuck in our thinking mind and is also uh, kind of dominated by our sense of vision. So our whole perception of the world is, you know, kind of our vision and then our interpretation of things, which, you know, you can't really, interpretations are are biased, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so... With a somatic practice, it brings the awareness, you know, kind of, you know, out of your mind and back into your body. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was, it was wild. Uh, Like my, uh, it felt like my, the center of myself, like the center of my awareness had shifted after that session with my friend temporarily. It's something definitely requires a lot of practice, but yeah, I mean, you're just simply more aware of your body. You're less, you know, you get pulled out of your thinking brain and, you know, anxiety, fear, insecurities, judgments of others, all that's immediately reduced. Uh, and I was, I was trying to practice this a bit while hiking in, uh, in Japan (laughs) out on the trail. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dude, I wish we could get like the brain thoughts from that. Cause that's wild. Yeah. Part of it is like, we're so dominated by our thinking mind, but like your body, like your body knows how to do stuff. Like your body mm-hmm. knows, can kind of like operate on its own, so to speak. And so one of the things 
like one of the brief experiences I had, I had it numerous times while hiking, but it was very brief. Like it takes a lot of practice. Um, but I was kind of like trying to bring my awareness back to like my body and, you know, really like reduce my reliance on vision, obviously trying to like reduce my thinking mind, which was extremely difficult. But there was times I was literally just zoning out. That might not be the best word, but I stopped, stopped worrying so much about like where I was walking um, and was kind of just like letting my body walk without mm -hmm. thinking about where I was going, without thinking about what steps I was taking. Just like letting my my body figure it out and then mm -hmm. stopped like f focusing so much on my vision. It was like trying to tune into my hearing, listening to the birds, leaves, squirrels and all that. And like, it, it's really hard to describe, but I wasn't like, you could say like, I almost wasn't like paying attention to where I was walking. I wasn't paying attention to where I was stepping. And I was just kind of like aware without thinking of my vision and like in those like very brief moments everything was like incredibly beautiful mm. like even just like the leaves on the ground it was mm. like it was it was crazy but then as soon as i acknowledged it and as soon as i thought uh, about the, my what i was perceiving it like went away mm. um so there's just like a lot of a lot of crazy stuff out there like we don't yeah that's like a pretty transcendental experience, but it's yeah. interesting when you say like you became more conscious of the whole thing happening and it, it kind of disappeared in that. I mean, it's it, the reality that we create around us is like the thing that I've always been curious slash freaked out about is like the gaps that we fill in that we our biases of how we think the world treats us, how we want to treat other people like, are all of our we all can go out and watch the same exact thing and we interpret it totally differently mm -hmm. and yeah it's just the human brain our condition Dude, freaking wild i was literally i mean i've been trying to been more be, be more conscious of this for several for a few years now but like literally on the way home um uh from the gym yesterday there's like some crazy person just driving like a maniac. And you know, at first, like your, your kind of initial response is like, you feel attacked, you feel threatened by it. Um, and like, you, you kind of get like angry at that person and all and everything. But I mean, they're just like living their own life. Like, like what you think is going on in their mind is like probably not what's going on in their mind. Like they're just driving their car differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not to, not to go too off topic, like, you know, you could debate, debate that a lot. But I guess the takeaway is, like, you don't know people's intentions. And like, you don't know what they're thinking. But I, th I think especially in Western culture, we just perceive others through our like, intent, like our, our thought processes and insecurities mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. Totally can't take those things personally it's so easy to internalize when it's just yeah it's, uh what is i'm trying to think of what the catch and release in meditation like sometimes i just do mm -hmm. that for like oh this is happening right now i see it i'm experiencing it i don't like it i'm just gonna let that go and move on and sometimes that's now me just not really responding to somebody i mean like ah yeah i'm gonna let that one fly see ya yeah, 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 exactly. It's freeing. It, I need to get better at practicing that. But any final words for the people? This was awesome, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, well, you know, so this is a cycling podcast. so. Um, but it, do you know what? Actually, actually, hold on. Before you say your thing, I did <laughs> one with uh, Eno, Eno Kenti. Uh, I'm going to crush your last name, you know, Zavalov, I think he's a gravel racer. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. I do not know. We had a really good podcast that we recorded and we were just talking about like the flow of podcasts. And I usually before have had more kind of like scripted questions and a couple friends were like, I think it would be cool if you just you, like, you're kind of an easy person to talk to. Just go talk to these athletes. Like don't really talk to them what you're interested about 
and not necessarily what all their workouts are. I'm like, oh, that's mm-hmm. interesting. So I did with one with Eno. And I was like, what do you think of this podcast? And he had heard the podcast before. He's like, dude, I love this. And I was like, okay, well, you were my guinea pig. Like, I tried to do this with Riley Pickroll that you just listened to. Mm-hmm. And I, like, got nervous and, like, went back to my <laughs> script. And so you're, like, one of the newer. And I was just super pumped to talk to you. And then as we were chopping it up about Japan or stretching and random things i'm like dude we gotta do a podcast on like just yeah. this stuff so yeah it's a cycling podcast but really this is more the brock mason podcast today so <laughs> le- le- leave <laughs> us with uh wh- wherever it doesn't have to be cycling specific yeah uh, well no um, pressure now <laughs> i killed your vibe sorry but it felt no, like no, it was no, important. No. uh just just going back to the race and thing and it's something i actually wanted to say earlier but we just kind of got distracted but um yeah just have fun and like i think kind of once i realized i could be good at racing with kind of like my power and engine and everything it was a bit high pressure intimidating stressful you know like now like getting the hang of racing like now i gotta perform and you know i could really stress you out but i just uh there are several things i did which you know helped absolutely tremendously and first one is obviously have fun um and try to relax like don't get so hyped don't get so amped up you know it's just a bike race it's just a group ride like i would just go to these races no matter what they were like even athens twilight i just like told myself i'm only here to go as fast as possible as easy as possible for as long as i can like Mm -hmm. Like, you can't replicate the experience you get in a race outside of racing. So, like, I'm just trying to go as fast as I can, as easy as I can, for as long as I can. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as you get closer to the finish line, I'd always, and I was doing this heavy in Belgium, um, chunking uh, chunking the race into goals. So a lot of people, like, might show up to a race and – they're like, oh, goals like a top five, like a goals like I want to win this race. And then they like run through all these hypothetical situations or scenarios of like how the race might go down. Race never works out like that. Then they're thrown off and they're like all stressed and everything. Um, so kind of my method to approaching racing and getting good results is to is to chunk it into bits and set goals. So like for an example, normal crit race, no breakaway or even if there is a breakaway, whatever. Um, But I might approach the race, obviously, let's say the race is one hour. So, like, make it 45 minutes with good legs. Like, conserve energy to the 45-minute mark. And I'm not concerned about anything, anything after that until I reach that goal at the 45-minute mark. And then, okay, uh, 10 laps left. So, uh, with five laps to go, I need to be, like, top 20. Not concerned Mm -hmm. about anything after that point until I get myself into the top 20 with five laps to go. Okay. Like three laps to go, like move up, you know, uh, top 10, not concerned about the finish, not concerned with anything because if I'm not top 10 with three laps to go, like nothing else matters. So I'm not Mm -hmm. even concerned with it. Then like final lap, like I gotta be like six, seventh position, you know, out of turn two, you know, like, like sixth position going into turn three. I don't care about the finish. Like finish is going to play out how it plays out. My race is my, like my entire goal is to be like sixth or seventh wheel going into turn three. And like, that's all I focus on. And then you, you know, come out of turn four and you just sprint. And so I've, you know, ever since I kind of thought to do this, this is how I've raced is, um, taking it one bit at a time and not trying to consume the whole race at once. Mm. And that's helped out tremendously. That's awesome. I love that. That's how would you recommend someone figure out their chunks? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> I kind of like though, that it's almost there's like a big first one, like it, it's, or maybe it's work backwards, you know, that might be beneficial to like think through how to play devil's advocate. Then what if the chunks don't work out? 
Um, just go with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just go with the flow, people. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's that's kind of another thing. Like, back when I was really bad at racing, I just like overthought way too much. Yeah. And I didn't like past couple of years. You know, you you get in races, and I mean, you can't help but think. Like, you're always thinking, but my mind is not like what's executing in the race. Like my body is executing in the race and like, kind of like what we were mentioning earlier, it's like your body knows how to operate. Your mind really just holds it up and stalls mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And so like while I'm racing, I'm not consciously like I'll have these goals, but I'm not letting my mind dictate what I'm doing. I'm letting the race play out and letting my body respond. Mm-hmm. Like there's been, numerous times in fact i think this was uh one of the times i uh or the first podium or the first win i got in belgium my body just acted and it like actually surprised me i was like oh wow i guess i'm attacking right now like like it just happened spontaneously it wasn't like something i thought or was thinking or was planning uh you know like i had you have like a general plan like all right, maybe, like maybe I should try to ride away like this lap right away with like four or five K to go or something. But then it's not like, okay, I'm going to attack at this specific time, like in this mm-hmm. specific scenario. It's just you kind of have your intentions in the back of your mind and then your body executes it when it's the right time. A window takes a lot of trust. Or, oh, <laughs> yeah, a window opens and the reaction just happens. It's like I always think mm-hmm. of, if you think go now, if so, that thing in your head is like, go now, go now. If I am like, oh, this thing is telling me to go, should I did it? Like if you start to calculate it, that's so over. Yeah. Like it's gone. Yeah. It's yeah. left. See ya. You missed it. All those. Like, that's good. Yeah. Like, like past couple of years, like getting in the break at twilight. Um, and like all, all the like biggest results of my racing and like kind of like the most impressive like feats or whatever. Uh, I just like, I wasn't thinking like my body just reacted. Mm-hmm. Um, you just race. So you definitely, yeah, just race. Just, just trying to go as fast as I can, as long as I can, as easy as I can. That's the secret. <laughs> there you go. That is the recipe. <laughs> I love that. It's not, and don't worry about the results. Do. Yeah. That's, I think that's huge. Letting go of mm-hmm. that, especially just mentally not having that burden. You just race so differently. It, yeah. Like, yeah. It's just so crucial, especially when you're trying to race at a race that has stronger riders on paper. You can't mentally conceive yourself beating them. If you still race, Mm -hmm. crazy things happen. Yeah. Yeah. What's uh, Instagram? What's the other best ways for people to follow along Strava or you blog or anything else like that? No, it's just, it's just Instagram. Um, I have a Strava, but I've like, I've been staying off of it for a while. I just trying to IG. Yeah. Just Instagram guys. Thanks for listening. Hit them up. We'll post the link because it's pedal bull my a and you might not (laughs) spell that. And we appreciate you taking the time to hear about Brock and his adventures. And we'll talk to you guys soon.